All right, praise the Lord. Welcome, everybody, to Perfect Love Worship Center, our Zoom Bible study, Wednesday night Bible study. It is good to see everyone here with their smiling faces and their um, bright eyed and bushy tailed, ready for a, another <laughs> wonderful Bible study. And I, I'm not lying, I, I really have been enjoying these Bible studies. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was nice delivering the word to you through the book of James, but um, it's, 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 I, I have to admit that I, I really uh, look forward to being able to sit back, relax, and enjoy um, the Bible studies that have been presented by Sister Patty, Brother Ed, and Sister Alma. Uh, they've been just really um, wonderful and blessed of God and, and, and have helped us to grow in our uh, understanding of the Word of God and, and, and what God is doing, wants to do through us and in us. And so we are ready for another uh, series of lessons that we'll be starting. But before we get started, we want to begin with prayer. And we want to invite anyone who has a prayer request that you would like to share at this time for the group to pray for. It doesn't mean you have to, if you have something that, that you want to, that, that you, that's going on, but you don't feel free to uh, let everybody know. What we used to do in our church was, um, you could just raise your hand and say, I have an unspoken request. And uh, we would all understand what that means, you know, that that's uh, something that you're not really ready to delve into as far as letting everybody know the details of, but just to, to keep you in, in, in our prayers. So I uh, just wanted to, to let everybody know that. So just want to invite everybody to uh, share if there's something that you would like the group to um, go to the Lord for. Oh, and please don't mention any names or real personal info because we are recording and uh, we it, it's out there in the in sort of the what at the cloud or whatever in the in the atmosphere and, and anybody can access it and um, it could possibly be a, a breach of, of of personal security so just try to keep details um, coded as much as possible. I'm asking for prayers for a gentleman that's in the hospital with COVID and he's on a respirator. All right. Amen. We'll pray for COVID is still out there. People are still suffering from it. So we need to keep them in our prayers. And I wanted to uh, ask that we remember that family that um, lost everything in the fire. Uh, keep them in our prayers. They, they're only allowed in the hotel for a limited time. So they need to find some place to, to move into. So um, keep them in your prayers. Special unspoken for me. Okay, Sister Alma, unspoken. All right, well, praise the Lord. Let's, let's go to our God who is on the throne. He is in control, even though the things around us seem to be out of control. One thing we can know for, God, for certain about God is that he never changes, and he loves and cares about us. He cares for these needs and cares for all the needs that are unspoken in this place, and we want to go to him as his children, his beloved children, uh, to beseech him for help with these uh, problems and these situations, these requests, and allow him to do the work and provide for us the uh, working out of these situations. In Jesus' name, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you with, uh, uh, with boldness and with uh, the ability to uh, have your ear at any time. And we come to you right now as your children, Lord, on behalf of these special requests that have been uh, shared with us today, Lord God, we pray for uh, this gentleman who's in the hospital with COVID, Lord, we pray that you would bring complete healing and restoration to his body, Lord God, help him to recover, bless and help those, everyone who's suffering from the effects of the COVID, Lord God, uh, give them a healing, Lord God, and restoration in their bodies, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord God, for uh, Sister Alma and her special unspoken request, Lord, you know and understand that situation. And we pray, God, right now that you would move in a miraculous way, that you would bring all things 
uh, into order, Lord God, and that there would be the restoration of of strength and of of, uh, of of the proper purpose that you have for this person, Lord God, in their life, Lord, in Jesus' name, and that you would destroy what the enemy is trying to do in that situation. We pray, Lord God, for this family that has uh, suffered a loss of all of their, ho their home and all of their possessions, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them and help them, Lord, continually as they struggle in this um, a time of uh, uncertainty, Lord, we pray that you would uh, provide for them a home, a haven, a place to be able to move into as soon as possible, Lord God. Uh, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would comfort their hearts and, and help them, Lord Jesus, God, strengthen them, uh, even as they are suffering under the weight of the concern and the anxiety that they're feeling, Lord God. Let your peace pass all understanding, Lord God, and all their wisdom, their earthly, earthly wisdom, and let them receive your wisdom, Lord God, and help them to turn to you, Lord Jesus, God, for their help in this situation, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for these things and every other need that is in this, represented in this group today, Lord God. We pray that you would move in miraculous ways, Lord God. Bring salvation, bring healing, bring restoration, bring provision, Lord God, according to your purposes, according to your plans. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you, Lord God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, at this time, uh, we are going to begin our uh, latest uh, entry into our uh, Bible study um, uh, lesson series, and this one is going to be on the, uh, the church, uh, uh, I will build my church, uh, lesson number one, and I believe Brother Ed, you will be uh, presenting this first lesson uh, God bless you. Have your take your liberty. Have your way, and uh, I give you the calm. Thank you, Brother Alex. I will build my church. This is part one of a, a lesson series written by and adapted from and, uh, a series. I will build my church, written by Pastor Raymond Woodward. As some of you may know or re recognize the name. Uh, Brother Woodward has a church up in, I believe, uh, up in Canada on the east side, uh, Nova Scotia, I believe. Maybe Frederick Ting, I think. Where is it, hon? <clears throat> Frederick Ting. Yes. I'm saying it correctly, yeah. That's in Nova Scotia, I believe. Yeah. yeah. I've actually visited his church when I was on uh, yeah. a tour with uh, Gateway. So you've been up there? <clears throat> yeah. So Pretty. And he's a, quite a dynamic teacher and preacher, and uh, this was adapted, adopted from, uh, I guess you could say adapted, uh, which is a similar word, <laughs> from that uh, lesson series. And so we give credit and thanks to Brother Woodward. And if any of you are uh, further interested in, in uh, his teachings, uh, you can find him on YouTube. Just look under the name Woodward. I forgot the, the name of the teaching series he has. Maybe Patty remembers it. But nevertheless, he has, he has a bunch of them, but it's yeah. Fredericton, New Brunswick. Oh, New Brunswick. Yeah. yeah. New Brunswick is not Nova Scotia. I don't think. No. Yeah. OK. Uh, Matthew 16, chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. The Bible says, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatsoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven here's the lord speaking to peter after peter uh confessed that uh, jesus was the christ and this is the first distinct mention of the church in the new testament given by jesus who is the builder of the church we do not build the church on our own we simply cooperate with the master builder what the church isn't what the church is not Interesting. I don't know how Patty got that X over there. That wasn't there. Is that pasted in there, Patty? Just a Patty? Yeah. Yeah. Very. It's you know bravely done. <laughs> <laughs> but the, it's not a material building. The word is never used in Scripture to refer to a material building. That's it's right. used 140 times in the Testament. And not, not, and never is it a material building. The language used of the church could not be applied to a building. Here's some examples. Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church. What does that mean? You know, put some more 
extensions on it or uh, what? No. Uh, Herod vexed harm or hurt the church. How can you vex a building? Maybe be able to harm it, knock it down, but you can't vex a building. Uh, Saul persecuted the church. And that's Galatians 1.13. And the church churches had rest. That's Acts 9.31. Only in the traditions of men can people go to church. But we use the expression all the time. Uh, not There's nothing wrong with that, but just to understand that we're talking about a word that refers to, and we're going to look at this in terms of three items. The church is not. We've already gone over it. It's not a building. There are two more. And the next one, number two, is the church is not a denomination. That's right. Matthew 16 and 18. Do we have that up there? On the top right. Yep. And who would like to read that? And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Yep. Hades hell same word mm -hmm. and notice that jesus does not say he will build his churches but his church there is only one church and its message has never changed now denominationalism is the belief that some or all christian groups are legitimate churches of the same religion regardless of the distinguishing labels beliefs and practices most Denominations have come about due to confrontation and conflict over differences in the interpretation of scripture. So there's a reason why there's a church in every corner. It's because of differences in interpretation of scripture. Unfortunately, this has led to much division and separation of the true church. And it is the reason why there are so many differing beliefs that fall under the banner of Christianity today. Mark 3.25 Someone read that. And if a house is divided, split into fractions, and rebelling against itself, that house cannot stand. Amen. If it's split into factions and rebelling, it will not last. So I'd like to depart from this uh, lesson and an, an insert an aside. Jesus said, if a house is divided against itself, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, it's important to realize that there is, is an issue here, because when we're divided and rebelling and against, it doesn't necessarily mean that the house, that is what we're, we're rebelling against, is going to fall apart and and disappear and not last in that sense that it disappears. The, the overarching principle is this, plus the fact that the Lord indicates to us that we can neither be, be a part of mammon and serve it and God at the same time. You cannot serve God and mammon. You will either hate the one and love the other, love the one and hate the other. You cannot say, serve God and man. So what, when you put these two principles together, where you have the, the, the indication from the Lord that the house cannot stand if it's divided. When you have factions like this, what really happens is it will either become all one or all the other. And when there's factions and rebelling, it is Satan vying amongst those to tear down the church so that they all become allegiant to satan as opposed to allegiance to god mm. and so when we talk about the house divided yeah. it's split into faction rebelling that house will not be able to last it'll become all one or the other and in that case all the other is that uh, of satan his realm the world just as there are many false gods but only one true god so there are many false churches and many false faiths but there is only one true church and only one true faith. Ephesians 4, verse 6, verse 3 through 6. Will someone read that, please? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Amen. Praise God. So, the church is not a plan B in the mind of God. It's not the alternative. The church was not merely instituted after the Jewish rejection of Christ, but rather was prophesied through the entire Old Testament. It was God's plan from the beginning. And in Genesis 22 and 18, the Bible says all nations were to be blessed by the seed of Abraham. And in Genesis 26 and 4, it says all the families of the earth were to be blessed by Abraham's seed. In the last days, all nations would flow to the house of God, Isaiah 2, verse 2 through 3. The Gentiles would seek the root of Jesse, Isaiah 11, 10. Many nations would be sprinkled with the blood of the Messiah. That's Isaiah 52 and 15. Many nations would be joined to the Lord in that day, says Zechariah 2, 11. And the name of the Lord would be great among the Gentiles, Malachi 1, 11. So you're going through the Bible from Genesis to Malachi, and he's citing all these where you know that the church is the principal thing in the mind of God way back before, before the cross, back 2000 plus years ago, 3000, 3,500 years, ago, way back to the time of the, the, uh, the creation and on through the flood period and so on. Now for what the church is and the church is the centerpiece of the kingdom of God here on earth. The kingdom of God is much larger than the church because it includes more than the church, the whole universe, all the angelic hosts, all the Old Testament saints. However, the New Testament church is the centerpiece of God's kingdom and its most important part. Now, if you live between the day of Pentecost and the rapture, you must be in the church to be saved. Jesus said the prophets who gave these prophecies and even the angels would love to participate, would have loved to participate in the things happening in our age. Matthew 13, verse 16 through 17. Someone read that, please. There it is. Jesus said to his disciples, blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Amen, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Amen. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 says, Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So there you go. Now, the church is the only thing God ever had to purchase. God created everything else, but the church cost him dearly. Amen. Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. We are privileged beyond measure to be part of the church of the living God. Someone read Acts 20 and 28. We have it up there. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Amen. Amen. You are bought with a price. And he says, there's a scripture that we, you are bought, we are bought with a price. Each yes. individual. And now we understand it is we, we are the church, the individuals making up the church. The building of the church is the expansion of the kingdom and the saints uh, share, uh, d d dispersing the gospel and the world hearing the gospel and those destined, those receiving the spirit, baptizing his name, coming into the church. The church is the only thing that cannot be shaken. Individual saints and local assemblies may have problems, but the church is as solid as the rock of revelation it is built upon. We were singing a song earlier, Honey in the Rock. Well, that's right. That, that's sort of like prescient because we're talking about Peter. He's the rock. It's the rock of revelation, which the church is built upon. The earth is to be shaken, says Isaiah 2, 19 through 21. 
And the nation of Israel is to be shaken, Ezekiel 38, 19 through 20. The heavens and the nations are to be shaken, says Haggai 2, verse 6 through 7. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, says the Hebrews 12, 26, and 29. But the church cannot be shaken. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it because Jesus is building his church. Amen. Now we have Matthew 16, 18 through 19 again. May uh, would ask someone to read that. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. Praise God. Whatever you bind on earth, be bound in heaven. Loosed on earth, loosed in heaven. Notice two principles in this passage. First, the church is built on a message, not a man. Men come and go, succeed and fail. But the true revelation of Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. It says, thou art the Christ, said Peter. He's straightforward. You are the Messiah. Second, we must build the church according to God's blueprint. If we want to have his blessing, we need to build or to, to uh, build a, a, according to the pattern, the blueprint. The words bind and loose are perfect passive participles in the Greek language. Won't get into the details of that. Alex probably knows it better than I do. Indicating things that have already been forbidden or permitted. We can't just do whatever we want and expect God to bless. It. We must do what he wants and the blessing will come automatically. If a contractor builds a house for someone, he sticks to the blueprint, which is the will of the purchaser. Now, you know, it, uh, me, through life, especially recently, I talked to folks and, you know, we, you'll have friends or people or acquaintances or whatever they'll say. They'll say, oh, so-and-so, or I'm, you know, I'm building this, but they're not doing it physically themselves. They're having it built. And the contractor builds a house for someone. He sticks to the blueprint. All right which is the will of the purchaser. So the most important thing is the blueprint, the plans, if you will. Amen. Amen. If we want to build a church, we need to stick to the blueprint, the Bible, which is the will of the purchaser, that is God. Otherwise, we are not really building a church. So we're in the business, if you will, of building the church, which is reaching to, to lost souls, ministering to their needs, that they might come to un understand and know the Lord, desire to be saved, desire to, and want to receive his spirit and be fit, be baptized in the name, his name, the deliverer, God our deliverer for the remission of their sins. Today, we're continuing to build the church upon that foundation, on the foundation which has already been laid by the apostles and prophets. Nothing's changed. That foundation is Christ, the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2 and 20. Do we have it up? Yes, it's there. Go ahead. Someone read that, please. Built, about, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Amen. So yeah, the, the metaphor there is, is a building for sure. It's not, we're not building a, a physical building, but you, the, the you know, the analogy and the metaphor is, is necessary because cornerstones, and if you go through the ancient world and go to and get tours of these places where they're going and, and describing temples and buildings and so on, uh, they will not hesitate, those who are lecturing, and that hopefully it's, a, it's a, an archaeologist or at least someone who understands and knows that in those days, the most important thing about a building was, you know, where you start and the first issue is the foundation and you have a cornerstone there's there is a reference point and that was the cornerstone it is everything is referenced from that point and jesus is our, our reference he is the chief cornerstone of the building the figurative building uh that we have which is the church which are consists of us we individuals now principle number one there are three principles we're going to look at that the church 
needs to do, needs, needs to be, to be the church. The principle is to do and teach. In Acts 1, verse 1, the Bible says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Do and teach. That's the, the highlight of the headline here of principle one. Jesus' ministry was all about doing and teaching. The one refers to his miracle working power, while the other refers to his doctrine. So Jesus did not work miracles just for miracles sake, but he used them to teach doctrine. That is, he healed a blind man and taught, I am the light of the world, fed 5,000 and taught, I am the bread of life. He also did not teach just for teaching's sake, but he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. This is capitally important when teaching that you're confident in what you're teaching is underwritten by God. The word of God being taught has intrinsic authority. It is God's word. And when we teach from God's word and are properly, rightly dividing it, as the Bible instructs us, then it will come as uh, uh, into our hearts as from a source of authority. And individuals must, we, we must know that uh, as we grow and in, in, in even in the world, when they grow in the world, people understand and recognize what authority is. I mean, the, there's governmental authority and local authorities and all that where, where you are in a position that you need to follow or obey the, uh, the uh, tenets and, uh, and rules and so on of that particular authority. The police have authority, jurisdiction over the roads, and you follow the rules of the road. Police come and, and will uh, cite you if you've been violating. So when we talk about the, the authority behind the word of God, we're talking about the word of God coming and being taught properly, and the teacher will have that awe, if you will, or about him or her, where it radiates the authority, the authoritativeness of the word radiates and is felt in the heart. And this was not as it was with the scribes. He says, he taught them, quote, he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That's really important to understand because the scribes were the teachers. They were telling people what to do and so on. They had traditions that they were uh, insisting people follow. And the Lord came around. The Lord came on the scene, if you will, and totally changed the paradigm of what was happening there, if you will. The Lord came and taught them with authority. They, he was a rabbi of rabbis. There were rabbis all over the place. And there were synagogues then uh, dispersed throughout Judea. And they, they had uh, teachers, but they did not have that authority behind them. Jesus taught them uniquely. And that's Matthew 7, 29. Now doing without teaching is wrong. So we got to be careful. We want to do and teach, but we have to do it together. Do and teach. Doing without teaching is wrong. It's wrong to have spirit without truth because that leads to apostasy. It is obedience to doctrine that saves us, not just a move of the spirit. It's not your feeling, but your obedience to God's word that makes you a Christian. In 1 Timothy 4.16, the Bible says, we have it up there, Patty? Yes, sir. 1 Timothy 4.16. Can I have someone read that, please? Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. But teaching without doing is also wrong. It is wrong to have truth without spirit because that leads to apathy. God holds us responsible for what we do with what we know. Talking about revival doesn't bring revival. Revival is spelled work. We got we to gotta <laughs> work. Work at it. James 1.22 says, but ye be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So we have that contrast and it's only together, doing and teaching together is what we, what we have is the first principle for the church. Our church must be both doers and teachers if we want to be blessed by God. John 
chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. May I have someone read that, please? I'll read if I can find it. Um, oh, uh, I see right it. Hand side. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Praise God. Now we move to principle number two. Church, as, as the church, we want to witness and wait. In Acts chapter one, verse seven through eight. May I have someone read that, please? I'll read it. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria <laughs> and mm, yep, to the Samaria. end of the earth. <laughs> Amen. Now, God has two words for time. Kronos is the Greek word, which means time, like clock time. Then there's, uh, and, and also quantity. Of I mean, it, it's clock time. For referring to hours and minutes and so on. Then there's keros, which means time measured by special moments or quality time. Uh, it is uh, perhaps one of the more, uh, the better scriptures to illustrate that is uh, from, uh, I believe it's from mm, Ecclesi uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, where they are, uh, they are the children of the children are in captivity and they're singing there with their harps and uh, talking about there is a time and purpose under heaven, time to kill and time to make alive and so on. I think you remember that. I think you're, you're that's an uh, yeah, it's Ecclesiastes. I don't think they're in the uh. Was Ecclesiastes written while they were in captivity? Yeah, I didn't know that either. No, I, <laughs> I was like, I think Solomon is considered the um, the writer of Ecclesiastes. Yes, indeed. But uh, and that is, but uh, they they put their harps down, and uh, that was in the captivity. But I believe yeah, that was that, a, that was a psalm. Be, yeah. Uh, yeah, that the uh, by the waters prophet, of Babylon. That's an Ezekiel uh, time frame. And okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, uh, but no, I'm, I'm pointing that out. I, I meant to get that scripture before, but I've been so busy but to, to get it up. But that's a good illustration. Uh, and, and indeed, it's such a beautiful lyric that they, I I'm not sure whether what the, the group, the song group, way back 40 years ago, actually composed a song based on those birds. lyrics. Anybody remember it? The turtles. I think it was the birds. No, it was oh, the, the turtles. Birds. The, the turtles. Bee, the bee. The turtles. The no. turtles. Yeah. <laughs> well, birds, turtles, whatever. <laughs> 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 By the rivers of Babylon, when we sat down. Oh, so, you. Oh, we're thinking uh, the ecclesiastical. Uh, oh yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. To well, everything, I, turn, 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 turn. turn, turn yeah. There is a seat. <laughs> I think yeah. you're, you're dead. You're talking about by the waters of Babylon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a different. That's okay. a different. Anyway, whatever. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the the, uh, the time to for every purpose under heaven, and so that's that's the type of time that Keros is is defined by. So the key that you is that you have to take advantage of Keros time, Keros time, at the moment it happens, or you lose it forever. So we have some examples here. So Luke chapter 19, verse 44. If someone would read that. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. There you go. 
Acts 24, verse 25 says, Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 16. Would someone read that? See then, that, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Right. We're in the time frame. The days are evil. Mm -hmm. uh, Galatians 6 and 9 says, and let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season and season and time, a period of time, alludes to a period of time. We shall reap if we do not lose heart. When the disciples asked Jesus was, when Jesus was going to restore the kingdom, that is, send revival, he told them that it was not for them to distinguish between the times, chronos, and the seasons, keros, because only God controls times of supernatural visitation. So, you know, they were looking for the exact, you know, date. When, when are you going to do this? <laughs> uh, that's a chronos time. And surely he said, not only he's, you, you, you won't know those times, but only the seasons. It's not even for you to know it between the times and the seasons because only God controls a supernatural visitation. Only God has power. Uh, exousia equals authority here. That's the word behind power. So they've trans, that what, what uh, the writer here has said is only God has power. That is exousia equaling authority over the results of our prayer, our, our worship and our work. But he has given us power and that Greek word is dunamis, which is uh, strength or ability to be witnesses. So we're given strength, and authority and strength to be his witnesses and to be, to be successful in building the church. The key to revival is for the church to exercise its ability until God exercises his authority. Amen. Okay. The Lord is ready to exercise his authority. That's coming. Now we need to exercise our ability, which where does our ability come from? It comes from the Lord. It's the grace, the enablement to do his will. We must witness and wait patiently. Principle number three is to rise above and go beyond. For the church to be effective, we want to rise above and go beyond. Acts 125, would someone read that please? Uh -oh. part, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. So this is uh, uh, from the account of the, uh, the selection of Matthias by um, the drawing of lots to um, fill the vacancy of uh, that 12th apostle, which Judas... Judas had forsaken. And so sometimes we mistakenly think that the early church was somehow more spiritual than we are today. But the book of Acts tells us plainly that they had problems and setbacks too. And, uh, you know, the selection of the, of Matthias, they, they drew lots. It was a really practical way to do it. The Lord is in everything. And so he revealed his will through that. Outside of the crucifixion of Christ, probably no other situation was harder for the disciples to deal with than the fall of Judas. He had been ordained to be an apostle, ordained to preach the gospel, and given power over devils and disease. And yet he backslid and betrayed the Lord into the hands of the Sanhedrin. What a setback for the church. But we do not see the disciples giving up or getting discouraged. Instead, they resolutely rise above their heartache and move beyond a terrible trial to embrace their future in God. With God, excuse me, failure is never fatal. God never wastes a hurt. We can have failures and hurts. They're not wasted because they are all in his total plan. Micah 7 verse, Micah chapter 7 verse 8. Someone read that, please. I like this verse. Do yeah. not rejoice over me, over my, oh, my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Great scripture. So in closing, let's rise above our past, our problems and our perplexities and go beyond to a place that we have never seen or never been before. And that's where the Lord is taking his church. We are part of his church. We have been baptized in his name, filled with his spirit. We are part of that building that he is building. And we are destined to be and go with him and join him when he returns to receive his church. If we are still alive, we'll be caught up in the air. And Lord, I, I say this is so, so uh, awesome, the concept, the understanding of it. But it's so important that we know and understand that there are things, principles that we need to uh, fasten to and apply. And we'll go over them. I'll go over them again. Principle number one, do and teach. Do and teach. And we can't just do. We have to do and teach. We can't just teach. We have to teach and do. It's a combination. Witness and wait. Very important. Uh, time is of the essence, of course. So that's a common expression. But it's it's a time that is in the hands of the Lord. We need to understand that. You certainly will witness and let the Lord do the work. And he will bring about the fruition in due time. And of course, finally, rising above and going beyond. And this is from a very practical and pragmatic sense, what we need to do in an everyday basis, just like they did right there, uh, maybe who knows how, maybe a week after uh, the Lord ascended and before the Holy Ghost fell, uh, they chose another, they had, you know, they learned that, that, uh, that Judas had killed himself and that they had there was in the will, in God's will, that they have a ministry consisting of the 12 apostles. They knew that this apostle should be replaced. It should be somebody who could take his place. And they simply went about, found the two, and pulled the, pulled the, the straws, however they took it. They drew lots. I'm not sure how they did it, maybe with casting stones. They said they cast lots. So however they did it, the Lord was in that selection. And it was a very practical way of moving beyond, moving and going along. And of course, we know the rest of the story. The Lord fell. The Spirit of God fell on them at, in the upper room. And the church was born and moved. And you know, uh, having read, and I would urge this, I re, I'd love to read Acts of the Apostles. It's, so, it's such neat history. It's all history. Yeah. Well documented. Uh, and you can picture all the events and so on. Um, and there's many, many uh, videos that you can get on YouTube and so on where they have the, uh, the acts of the apostles documented Peter and Paul's efforts and works during that first century church. It's very interesting and very, very much practical. And, and we can look at it and compare ourselves to them and understand that nothing's changed. Our doctrine, our doctrine is the same and we are to stick by it. Don't be swayed by every wind of doctrine, but stick by the doctrine, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, filled with the Spirit, baptized in his name for the remission of sins. Now, there are no, there are no discussion questions. Does anybody have any discussion questions they'd like to bring up? What, is the, what does apostasy mean? Well, isn't that like a falling away? Well, it is, yeah. But uh, a pure definition. Aren't you on your phone, Alex? There's the. Uh... No, I no, I I know what it means, but I I heard you say that earlier, and I was just thinking about our new members that might not know what that means. Very good. Well. Oh yeah, great definition. You got it, Sister Patty? Yeah, do you have it? Uh, no, go right ahead. Okay, according to Merriam-Webster, um, very popular uh, dictionary, they define it as an act of refusing to continue to follow, obey, or recognize a religious faith. Very good. Yes. 
the abandonment or renunciation of a religious or political belief. In other words, renouncing your faith, renouncing yeah. the Lord. Yeah. So falling away from the faith or backsliding. Yes. Exactly. That's, that's, that's apostasy. Yeah. That can result from, you know, <laughs> this is back to principle two, doing and teaching. You have to combine it, do it and teach. You can't separate one from the other. Doing without teaching can lead to apostasy. Obedience to the doctrine is what saves us. And so we must so, stick to the doctrine and obey it that we might not fall into apostasy. Well, Amen. Brother Ed, um, you mentioned in your teaching that the doctrine hasn't changed. It, it's the same doctrine from the beginning. Amen. So this is how apostasy comes in when people begin to change the doctrine. Right. And they begin to say, oh, you know, that's not really what the Bible meant. You know, this yep. was just tradition. We were yes. just doing this. That's apostasy. So if the doctrine never changes, that means it's the same yesterday, today, and it's going to be the same tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Because Jesus is the same. He doesn't Amen. change. Praise Amen. You. That's a really good point. Yeah. It's, it's, an, it's right down, right down the middle. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Sister Pam. I'm, I'm sorry. Sister <laughs> Pam. I would love to have that's, Sister Pam on That's going to be her <laughs> new nickname, Sister Pam. <laughs> <laughs> Jamaicans have lots of names, you know. <laughs> so, Roseanne, you know where I get it from now. <laughs> Just naming people. <laughs> yeah, I love it when your dad sometimes starts calling out the kids and he's like oh oh and you're standing right there and he goes through all this <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i remember, remember listen that i only have one kid and i go through that with other, everybody else <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i include the dogs yeah yeah <laughs> that I oh bet. yeah i've called i've called my husband by the dog's name <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 it's easy to do yeah it is yeah yeah well, I, it's easy. That's explainable because uh, I'm so much like uh, Ben and, and, no. and so on. <laughs> Always sleeping in front of the fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope everybody uh, got uh, uh, the got what's necessary. I hope this fed you. It fed me doing this, and uh, you know, it's such a it's just a, such a joy to uh, to know that in the church. We're in the church and we're going up and we're I, looking and we're looking for that hope. We're yeah. looking for his. Other his Ed, <clears throat> I think another important point in this lesson was denominationalism. Because yes. I've had many people ask me, well, you know, can I just go to any old church? Mm. Can I just, you know, what's wrong with this church or that church? And I think that really explains it scripturally. Yeah. Right. You know, that, um, that it is the matter of the interpretation of the scripture. And it's because right. of disagreement that people just walk away yes. from one and go to another. Right, exactly. Amen, that's exactly right. But but I rem but the thing that came to me when I was doing the PowerPoint was Aquila and Priscilla. The Bible says that they went and they explained the word of God more perfectly. So there is a place where you can come from one level of understanding to another that God leads you into greater truth, greater understanding. Amen. And that was one aspect of that, that really blessed me. I was like, okay, God, because we're always learning. We're always learning new things. You know, we're never really, you can't stay where you were yesterday. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise Amen. God. I was, um... Sorry. Well, All right, brother Alex. Now, what were you going to say, sister Nicole? I have a question actually. Um, so I'm just curious. I think I might know the answer, but I want to make sure. So when the apostles were walking with Jesus, right? And he given them, he gave them power and authority to heal the sick, right? And cast out devils. So that's when Jesus was here with them walking. And obviously after they were filled with the spirit. So is it because Jesus was walking with them that they were able to do that? Because they weren't filled with the spirit yet. I guess that's Good my question. question. Good question. 
So I'm like, is it because I literally had him with them and he gave them the authority there, you know? And then yes. later it's because they were, they were filled with the spirit. So like after he left, so for that short time when they didn't, they weren't filled with the spirit, they couldn't do those things, right? So is that maybe they were in trial and stuff like that? And then he came and filled them with the spirit and that's why then they were able to do that and even greater. I think, what? Yeah. oh, um, what, what in examining those texts, um, they reported back to him that they were doing all these things in, in his name. And that's where the authority is, right? And the, yeah, that's where the authority is. Uh, the reason why they hadn't done it, they, you know, they hadn't done it on their own before the day of Pentecost is because they, the, what the Holy Ghost gave to them was, was the, uh, it, it changed their, their timidness. You know, they had been hiding when Christ had been put on trial, they were afraid they were still in their, uh, fleshly human kind of spirit you know the, the this uh spirit of the world the, the they were they were intimidated by the world they were uh you know they, they had been with christ they, they they loved his message but they were still in that spirit of 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 being intimidated by by the world when the holy spirit came upon them they were filled with the same zeal of christ and it was that zeal that that came out through them that Peter was able to stand up and speak Christ finally to the people without fear of anything. I mean, he was able to go Thanks before God. people. He was able to be go, go before the Sanhedrin, and that is that is why they began to to trust that when they prayed for people in the name of Jesus Christ, they were going to be healed. Uh, the Holy Ghost empowers us to take hold of the truth of Jesus Christ and his authority and his power to go out and to um, do great things and to uh, uh, perform his purpose. And were they uh, doing it, but they were, were they doing it before that or they were just with Jesus when he did it? When they, they did it according to his command under his authority and his leadership. Um, they went out and they, were able to do those things. It was sort of like a uh, Jesus giving them a, a chance to to uh, test their their faith and to test their trust in Him, and to to, to encourage them. Yeah, to encourage them that yes, it's not just going to be me that's going to be performing miracles. It's going to be you too. This is for you, and uh, and you can do these things through me. But He had not yet been uh, crucified and 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 resurrected yet, and. Uh, so they they were going out based on their obedience to him and, and without the kind of knowledge and understanding that the Holy Spirit gives us when we receive it. And so when Jesus Christ came into their hearts, the, that power and that authority yeah. just filled them and they were able to, to go out and be Jesus's hands and his feet and his voice. And so there, there was so... The, the Sanhedrin didn't have just one man to try to deal with. They had all these people, hundreds of thousands of people that were going out and healing people. They were they were uh, working miracles. They were turning the world upside down, and yeah. and that's that's that was the power of the Holy Spirit. I've I've okay. heard of I've heard of people like kids, right, um, or people don't who don't have the Holy Ghost yet, like laying their hands on someone. And, and that person being healed. Yeah. And yeah, I believe cool. that, you know, the whole thing about healing and, and the power of God is that God can do anything through anyone. Yes. Well, I mean, it is very important to have the Holy Ghost, but God can even move through people who don't have the Holy Ghost if he wishes. He's, he's not a God that we put in a box. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I guess he Milton honors his work. That's where I kind of was wondering, or is it more to, to me, like, like that as well, what you were saying, I mean, he used the donkey in the Bible, but it also got me thinking, like, it really shows you the power of the name of Jesus Christ, like, the Amen. Authority, yes. right, because they were yeah. doing it, like, in the name of Jesus, even before they were filled with the spirit, even though he was there, so he's, you know, present and stuff, um, that's where I always kind of, like, wanted clarity, but like she said, I mean, he could do whatever, you know, he wanted, like in the Old Testament. 
um, when it came upon them. Yes, you right. know, absolutely. Like, so then there'd be like outside of them. So to me, I was like, oh, so that's why people could still do it because it's not, it's the name of Jesus Christ. He honors his word. He, and, and when, when people speak out in his name in faith, he honors his word and, and faith, yeah. And faith. And, you know, there, there are people who, you know, are, are not filled with the Holy ghost, but they've learned that when they pray in Jesus name, things happen. Yeah. Um, it used to be in the denominal world that, um, prayers were always ended in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy ghost, but it, it changed over time. And recently I, I've noticed that, that now people who are, who don't believe everything that we believe, they pray in the name of Jesus Christ. They understand the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Well, and, because, with the, and some of them are filled with the spirit. And some of them are sp filled with the spirit as well, but it's, 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 it's interesting right. that, that, you know, there was that shift within the denominal world. Yes. Well, I, I didn't, um, uh, what is his name? Chris Green. Didn't he mention that when Victor Jackson went down to where, um, you know, the situation after with George Floyd, when he went down there, he said that, um, that guy that was like, he was like a big evangelist going around after they saw him baptizing people. He started uh, baptizing them in the Father, the name of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit after seeing Victor Jackson because he was oh, so wow. moved in the spirit. Yeah. I wow. remember Chris was sharing that with us uh, at one of the Bethel services. So to me, that spoke, you know, just that. And like, I know a lot of people that are different denominations, they do everything else in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Because yeah, that's, that's, where, that's where power is. Revelation is coming, is my point of yeah. bringing them. The other Patty. thing that I always heard um, is, you know, like Sears and Roebuck and Levi jeans, you know, Levi and sons, they, they were Jewish, uh, um, what do you call it, manufacturers or store, department mm -hmm. store uh, leaders, you know, at the time. And they always applied the principles of God's word. And that's why their companies, you know, maybe not now because things have changed. Okay. But they always, they were, they were um, renowned for their success because they, they knew that they were Jewish and they applied God's principles in Proverbs, just applying the word of God, like you were saying, Alex, um, gave them, they, they, they positioned their companies within the realm of the Proverbs of God. Amen. And so yeah. they were blessed. They were, they were wise and in that regard. <clears throat> no, I was saying that is so true because I think on a whole, mankind is looking for whatever works. And so I know for sure that some companies, I mean, even some departments in the hospital where the leaders believe that prayer is the thing to do, yeah. they will allow their their workers to pray they will pray before meetings they will pray after yeah. meetings yeah. yeah and i know individuals who pay their tithes because they um, know yeah. tithing works yeah. and they will not give up on paying their tithes wow. even though they are not apostolic they have not accepted the gospel but whatever they know will work Amen. they will they will do it they're practical yeah yeah mm -hmm. Amen. So imagine that when people and even think about people that are like into other things, you know, because they, like you said, Sister Alma, they want, you know, a solution. So imagine solution with love in a relationship, you yeah. know what I mean? So, and that's, that's what I feel like the difference is, yeah. you know Absolutely. what I mean? Is yeah. like the combo, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, how did they say that? Whole enchilada, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Holly. <laughs> exactly it says i'm hungry i'm saying that <laughs> all right well everybody thank you so much brother ed thank you for that uh lesson it, it has sparked a lot of conversation and um it, it was uh dense and very um uh very needful and helpful for us to be able to 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 have a uh a better concept of what it is that we're doing and why we are here and what God is doing through us as his church. And so we want to, we look forward to the further lessons in this series, but uh, let us uh, 
prepare to separate with, with a prayer and ask God to be with us and go with us as we go our separate ways.